Welcome back to the podcast. This is episode 10, and I am so excited to have with us today Stephanie Maslow Blackman. She is going to share with you all about how she was able to scale her product based business to multiple six figures and go beyond just Etsy. So I hope you'll stick around. Welcome to the Product Biz Made Easy podcast, where we help you scale your product based business. Your award winning host and serial entrepreneur, Becky J. Anderson, created an eight figure product based brand that was sold all over the world and in big box retail stores. Each week, she will be sharing sales strategies, marketing advice, or inspiring interviews to help you scale your product based business. Now, on to the show. Okay, Stephanie. I am so excited you're here. Thank you so much for coming today. Today on the show, I have Stephanie Maslow Blackman. Hi, how are you? It's good. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me here, Becky. Oh, I'm so excited to have you here. I'm so excited to share your business with the listeners because I love your business. So for those of you that don't know, Stephanie owns the company Metalicious. It's a great handmade jewelry business. So I'm going to let her tell you all about herself and her business right now. So do you want to give us, um, for those that don't know you, give us the overcap about your business, Stephanie? Absolutely. So Metalicious is completely online. We are a fine jewelry company. We focus on making unique wedding bands and and non-diamond engagement rings and beautiful, fine finely handcrafted um, body jewelry, like earrings and necklaces and bracelets. Um, But what makes us unique is that everything is handcrafted here in New York City. So you might hear some horns in the background, I apologize. And it's handcrafted from recycled sterling silver and fine gold and ethically sourced gemstones. So when I've been in the industry for over 20 years at this point, and I worked for some you know, mass manufacturers and small jewelry businesses, and I saw how much waste there was um, with the gold and the stones and, and the lack of care that people were taking when they were you know, selecting their materials to work with. Um, and so I vowed when I had my own company that I would pay specific attention to that because I have two boys myself, I'm a mom, and I wanna leave the world a better place for them. Um, and for future generations. So I knew that I wanted to be very careful in the kind of materials that I chose, um, the kind of gemstones, the kinds of vendors that I work with, the stone cutters, um, to even the casting company that I work with. I'm very, very careful with who I work with. Um, So you'll find lots of beautiful things on my site. All of the designs are inspired by nature and architecture. So you've got some flowing organic forms mixed with like geometric shapes in a really unique way. Um, And it's funny when a lot of people find me, they say, oh my gosh, this was the jewelry that I dreamed about. So, um, you know, we like to say we're the non-department store jewelry company because we're kind of the, you know, the opposite of that. It's you don't see our stuff everywhere. That's probably why I love it so much because I absolutely love your brand and everything you stand for. You've done a great job at putting your unique selling proposition right out there. And I think it's one of the things that's made you so successful. So for those of you that don't know Stephanie's brand, it is a multiple six figure brand and she's done it all online and all handmade. So it's just absolutely incredible. You'll have to check out her website. So Stephanie, how did you get started selling jewelry? So it's funny, I, um, I never really wore a lot of jewelry as a kid. And, um, you know, I was, I finally, I graduated from college and I was in this job that I had studied for for four years in the television industry. And I just hated it. It just was not for me. But I'd always been very good with my hands in terms of, you know, understanding how things work and taking things apart and putting them back together. And I'm kind of a nerd. So I decided maybe if I do something in the evenings, like take some classes where I work with my hands, that'll be able to kind of give me that creative outlet. So I called the local art school and I asked them, you know, if they had a pottery making class, because that's the epitome of working with your hands, right? Yeah. So I uh, called them asked about the pottery class and they said, oh, we're so sorry, it's full. 
And they said, but we have this class, this metal smithing and jewelry making class. And I was like, I don't even wear jewelry, but I will take it, whatever you have. And you know, from the minute I started sawing my name out of copper with a saw, and using a torch and melting metal and fusing things, it was like I was home. Love that was what sight, my huh? hands were meant to do. It was crazy. So it's funny. I still have this um, one of the vessels that I created in one of my first classes. It, I call it my copper copper tin can because it looks like a can, and I still have that vessel up on my workbench. So that it's a reminder of how close I came to missing my calling. Oh, wow. What a great reminder. Yeah. So taking a class and falling in love with jewelry making is one thing, but turning it into such a successful business is another. So how did you get your first sell? And how did you, at, at what point did you go, I have a business here? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So I first started out um, when I was taking classes at night, I just, it was the only thing I lived, I, I would eat, sleep, and breathe jewelry in between, you know, working a full-time job. And so my friends were finally sick of me just talking about it all the time. They're like, you need to just get a job in jewelry. So that's what I did. And that's how I worked for these other manufacturers. Um, for about 12 years, I, I worked for other businesses. And I flew all over the world. I was in India, and I was in China, and I was in Thailand, and all over the, the world just working with these factories, building these factories overseas. And so, you know, it was a very, it was a great education in a way because I saw how businesses worked and how they, they could work and the things I liked and the things I didn't like. And so when I got pregnant with my first son, who is now 13, um, after I had him, I decided I didn't want to do that traveling anymore. So I wanted to be a stay at home mom and I figured I would do my jewelry kind of on the side, you know, and anybody who's a mom of, a, of young kids knows that you really don't have time. There's right. no, you know, like when they nap, you should nap. When they eat, you have to eat. Right. There's no downtime. But I, I found some time in between, um, you know, or late at night, um, sometimes on weekends when my husband was home to watch, watch my son. Um, and I did some craft fairs. So that's kind of how I started. But I didn't really take it seriously as a business until I had my second son, who is now um, eight years old. And when he was four months old, I was actually rushed to the hospital to get emergency back surgery. Oh, so no. Here I was, like, supposed to be the, the caregiver for the kids, the stay-at-home mom with the little jewelry business on the side, and I couldn't take care of my kids. I couldn't bend. I couldn't lift. Um, and so we had to hire somebody to take care of my kids. And I said to my husband, you know what, it's fine. I, I'll go back to work so that we can pay for this person. And he said, no. He said, give it two months. He goes, I see what you can do. I see how people are excited when they, when they buy your jewelry and wear your jewelry. Just give it two months and see how it goes and give it a go. And that's what I did. And within three months, Becky, I'll tell you, I was able to not only pay for my sitter, but I was also able to pay for us to go on a little vacation, a family vacation that year. Wow, that is so incredible. Yeah. So tell us about your first sell. Where did you get it? So it's interesting. My first sale was at a market. I think I did the Hoboken Craft Festival for the first year that they had it. And that was where I actually sold my jewelry. Um, and I can remember having to explain to people how I made things. And I was so excited about the, the sourcing of the materials and, and the, the qualities of the gemstones. And people loved it. They were so excited to support a little handmade artisan um, at my little table in Hoboken. And I still remember I have a picture of uh, my, my husband brought my son there. Um, it was really funny. It was just a fun time. So that was my first sale. Um, and I can remember how I had to really think about what made my jewelry so special and unique because, you know, everybody was a jewelry maker at, at the time and they still are like, everybody is at making jewelry. They're, you know, 
models or, or actresses are making jewelry lines now. Right. So it's very competitive. So you really have to think about what sets you apart from other people, what, what kind of jewelry you make and how it sets you apart. And that can come from anything. It can come from the style that you use. It can come from the stones, the colors, the metals, um, where you're inspired. Um, but you really need to understand that and understand what differentiates you from everybody else in the market. I think that goes for any product. Exactly. And it doesn't matter what you sell. I have the same thing with my candles. I had my unique selling proposition so set down that when I would go in with a buyer and they'd say, but we have Yankee. And I'd say, but we can sit side by side with Yankee. Let me explain why, you know, and once you know, you overcome most of your competition. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think when people have a clear understanding and they can, they can sense your passion, they want to jump right on board with you. Yeah. Well, I'm telling you, you have done a great job at, at screaming your unique selling proposition from the rooftop and your website very, very clearly states that. So you're completely 100% handmade still today. Yes. Everything is handmade here in New York City. That's even better. Yeah. That's cool right here in the U.S. Thank so, you. Thanks. So what platforms do you sell on today? So you can find me on uh, Etsy. So, you know, metalicious.etsy.com. And then you can find me um, just at metalicious.com. Those are the two places where I'm selling. Um, you can also find me on Instagram at Metalicious Jewelry, all one word, um, and on Facebook. And it's the same thing, at Metalicious Jewelry. Yeah. So out of the platforms that you're using, Etsy and Shopify, where do you get the most sales? Right now, um, right now it's, it's probably still Etsy, but I've been working really hard over the past year and a half to kind of switch that switch the, the, where, where the bulk of the sales are coming in. Um, I love Etsy. I will always love Etsy. I will always sell on Etsy. They've, they've helped me grow my business from, you know, when I was not able to take care of my kids and I was scrambling for, for money. Um, so they've always been there for me. So I will always love Etsy. But the thing about when you put all your eggs in one basket, and you're not diversified with different, different ways of selling, if something changes in that one area where you've got everything you're banking on, on that one thing to come through for you, if they change something, like Etsy changes their algorithm, their search algorithm all the time. Yes, they do. So, and they change where they're advertising and they change who they're, what their, their customer is. I have no control over that. So, that's why it's smart to not just focus on one or the other. It's the same thing with, I wouldn't just have metalicious.com as my only way of, of generating revenue. You need to have different buckets so that you can, you know, not just depend on one thing. And when one thing isn't doing well, the other things will take care of you. Exactly. I like to see you have five buckets, the more you scale. So, but that's great. You're doing such a good job on Shopify and trying to push your, um, building your list and pushing that side of the business as well. And, you know, like I agree with you, Etsy's great. Etsy's been there for a lot of people, but you know, and a lot of people think it's impossible to scale on Etsy and you've done a great job doing that. Thank you. Thanks. How it's it's you, taken a lot of work. <laughs> I bet it has. That's what I was going to ask you next. How have you done that? Like what marketing have you done to drive people to your store? So part of it is just coming, it just comes through Etsy and understanding, for the most part, the search algorithm, which they, they keep top secret. So you're never really sure what the search algorithm is. And when they change it, you can definitely see a difference in your sales. So I think the main thing for me was, is just staying on top of the changes that Etsy makes and adjusting my listings, adjusting my titles, adjusting my tags, my descriptions, my photos. They just allowed us to add 10 photos to a listing. That's great. Um, so, you know, just staying on top of the changes and moving with them. Because the worst thing you can do as an entrepreneur is just throw your hands up and say, well, I give up. That's it. I can't, you know, they changed and I can't change with them. Right. You have to kind of figure out the, the entrepreneurs that are the most successful are the ones who go with the changes. 
Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. So how often do you have to go in and change all that? Like how often are you spending time doing that on Etsy? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, it's kind of just an ongoing basis. I think when I first realized there was an, a, a change in the algorithm, it was probably about two years ago, I had to really, I mean, I have over 300 listings in my shop. So when you look at it that way, you're like overwhelmed. Right. So I just broke it up into chunks and I literally would do three to five listings every day. I would look at them. I would optimize them. I would see how people are searching for them. I would take new photos and you know, three to five is a lot easier to do than 300. Exactly. It, it took me a long time, but I did it. I did it and it was worth it. And that, you know, it showed in my sales. Um, yeah, so now I just, just kind of, tweak things here and there. I, I stay on top of my stats. I stay on top of all of the tools that Etsy gives you to, to check your shop. Um, it's really just that part of it is a full-time job, honestly. Yeah, it is. But it's great how you've broken it up. It's like that slide edge thing where little um, things added up turn into great big results over time. So to just continually be doing it, is it just part of your systems and processes for the day now? You just have that part of your daily schedule? Yes, as I go in, there's, there are other things that I do on Etsy, whether it's listing a new item or I'm constantly in my shop. I'm constantly in there. Yeah. So when I'm in there, I know, take a look at two or three listings, make sure that they're optimized, double check and make sure you're using the right keywords. Um, so it's just something that's, yeah, it just naturally is part of my, my routine. That's great. That's great. So do you attend trade shows or not? You're just strictly online. For now, I'm strictly online. I do have a growth plan, and part of my growth plan is to um, start doing um, more higher-end craft fairs. So, um, you know, like the Columbus Circle Holiday Fair, things like that. Yeah. Um, just so that, again, I can work up to my Becky Anderson five buckets. I'm working <laughs> on I am. It's, it's so smart. It's such a smart thing to diversify because you, you literally, you, you could lose your whole business in a day if you just bank on one revenue stream. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that have done that and that's happened. So it's, you're smart. You know, you just build one, perfect it, move on to the next, build it, perfect it, and just keep doing it. That's great. So um, tell me this, how much advertising do you do? So because I'm online, again, I'm very specific and targeted about where I'm advertising. Um, and again, this, get, this goes back to like how well you know your audience. You know, right. you ask me where, where, where I am online. Well, I have a Twitter account and I had a Snapchat account. But you know what? That's not where my customer was hanging out. Um, so, you know, I tried them for a little bit, but when I wasn't seeing any traction, I didn't want to waste my time. I'd rather spend that time on the, the two social media places that really bring in my, bring in revenue for me. And that was Instagram and Facebook and Pinterest actually. Right. Um, so that's really where I spend my advertising dollars. And also I look for bloggers that have. Um, like a, a symbiotic, you know, we have like a, a similar aesthetic or a similar like eco-friendly, ethical, sustainable weddings. Um, I search for people online who are writing about that and I reach out to them um, and either do partnerships or collaborations um, just so that I can get more traction with some of their audience. Their audience can learn something new from me. Um, so yeah, I just try to keep it online. I did do an ad and I'm always testing things out because again, the, the online world changes daily. <laughs> so you really need to just try new things and tweak things and, and be, you know, just on top of your numbers and checking your numbers. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah, so you've had success then with the bloggers and influencers. Do you find that most people you reach out to are willing to do collaborations with you? Or is it, you know, a percentage? What, how's that worked for you? So I'd say probably for every 40 bloggers that I reach out to, 
Um, maybe eight to 10 of them will respond and be interested. Um, but again, I don't give up. I don't just never write back to those other 30 bloggers. I will continue to, you know, not be annoying, but every once in a while I'll reach out with a new idea um, to see if they're interested. Because again, you never know what's going on in people's lives. Like, you know, right. maybe they're sick, maybe they're in the hospital, maybe they're too busy with an event they're working on. Like you never know. And it, it takes a lot, even, they say that it takes like eight to 10 touches with your customer. It's the same thing with bloggers and influencers. Like they're it not is. You're right. with you right off the bat necessarily. So you can't, you can't let that stop you and you can't take it personally. Right. They want to know who you are and feel good about your brand before they just jump on it. That's, that's very true. Um, so that's great. So are you continually, that's just part of your marketing efforts every month. You try to have a certain amount of influencers that you're working with. Yes. And well, less influencers, more bloggers. Um, yeah. I think because my customer in particular, they're, they're, they don't value influencers necessarily. That's not, that's not what, that doesn't give them a reason to buy. They're more about research. Mm -hmm. So they enjoy reading a blog article rather than seeing somebody famous wearing my jewelry. Um, yeah. And again, that's something that I learned over time too, with just experimenting, you know, with having people wear my stuff and talking about it. And, you know, my, my audience doesn't really care about that kind of thing. They'd rather learn about the process or see behind the scenes or, you know, learn something. It's that touch point, that product knowledge thing. So that's probably why the blogger, um, working with bloggers has worked better for you. Yes. Your customer yes. wants to see that. And it's part of your unique selling proposition also, because the blogger can explain all of that. Yeah, exactly. Whereas the influencer just wearing it, they're not necessarily explaining all of it. Right. So how have you been able to keep up with be in a multiple six figure business and just being handmade. Do you have employees? Yeah. So one of the things that happened on Etsy a couple of years ago is they opened at first they were just a strictly handmade one person or small collaborative group. Um, that's all that they allowed. And that was fine with me because I am a metal Smith and I love making jewelry. Um, but then they changed and they decided to let anybody who had any idea, they could scribble it on a napkin and fax it to China. And then, you know, that's what they considered handmade. So there was the, the market was flooded with a lot of, um, a lot of stuff that wasn't necessarily handmade by one person. And it was really upsetting at first. A lot of people left Etsy because of that. But again, I was like, okay, after I was, I got over myself, I got over being upset about it. I said, well, how can I make this work to my advantage? And I knew that when you're making everything yourself, that's only scalable to a certain point. There's only so much jewelry I can physically make. Right. Um, and I want to spend time with my family. Like I want to spend sure. time with my kids and my husband and my friends and my family. So, you know, it just isn't scalable when you're the only maker. So I kind of embraced that a little bit and I started working with um, a small handful of other metalsmiths who work here in New York City. Again, I wanted to keep it local um, because again, it's so important to me, you know, from my experience, when we started building factories overseas, when the companies I worked for started building factories overseas, they laid off everybody in New York. So there, it was just devastating to see my friends jobless. They're super highly skilled uh, jewelers who were jobless. So I vowed again when I started my own company to create jobs in New York. And when Etsy, you know, changed what they were allowing on their site, it kind of opened me up to, to that in a different way where I was like, you know what, maybe, maybe it's time, maybe it's time to change with, go with the change. So that's when I started um, working with a small handful of jewelers here. I also have an assistant who helps me with everything from she runs errands up to the jewelry district. She does shipping. She does, um, you know, some customer service. Um, she's great. So I have her working for me part time. And then I have somebody who works remotely um, who does some analysis for me. I'm like I said, I'm a super nerd. And so I love 
the numbers, um, analyzing the numbers. And it's important when you're a business owner, you know, you can't just say, Oh, I'm an artist and stick your head in the sand. You got to really know your numbers and look at them. So that's really smart. You've done a great job of embracing the business side of your business. And it, it resonates with the customers because they've been able to find you, buy your products and you've been able to scale. So that's great. That's great. Thanks. You've really tapped into that. Thank so you. How has your business changed since you started? Have you had to pivot? Um, you've, you've clearly had to pivot with, uh, like you said, with Etsy on different things like that. But are there any other things that you've had to make major pivots in your business on? Yeah. I mean, it's, we're constantly pivoting as entrepreneurs. Um, we should be called pivotpreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> we should actually. We're constantly, you know, things happen, you know, things happen in life. Like for example, with my back surgery, that wasn't something I could predict would happen. Right. Um, so things in my business that have happened, I'd say when I first, I started my business in a little corner of my bedroom. I had my little workbench in the corner of my bedroom. And finally, when I got big enough, I could move everything out into my own studio space. That was like a huge win for me. I was so excited to have my own space. And I was there for about two years, and then the the um, the person who was renting the space to me decided they wanted to change how they did things, and they wanted to, you know, let everybody because we were all small businesses on the same floor. They were not going to renew any of our leases because they wanted to lease the space out to one big company. So I was like, oh my gosh, I've been here for two years. This was my little home, my little studio, what do I do? And I had to find another space. But I'm in New York City and small spaces, huh? small spaces are so hard to come by. So I literally walked the streets of New York up and down um, within a specific, because I wanted to be within a specific area so that I could be close to my kids' school. And I literally walked the streets. I probably spent four hours just walking, calling numbers, talking to doormen, walking into buildings, you know, going up in elevators to the offices um, until I found the space that I'm in now. So, you know, things happen. Like I, I thought I was going to be in that first space for the rest of my life, <laughs> for the rest of my business life um, and stuff happens. So you just have to kind of, again, go with it and, and do what it takes to get things done. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. So yeah, I can only imagine what it would be like finding space in New York city. So you go to an office or you go to your little studio every single day, right? I do. Well, Monday through Friday. Yeah. So you try to keep it business hours. Do you go like eight to five or when the kids are in school? How do you do that? Yeah. So I, um, now my kids are a little bit older. Um, and again, I have a, uh, somebody who picks up my younger son some of the days. I mean, I still like to pick him up from school. I, you know, pick them up twice a week. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I really treat my business like a business, like any other job that I would have. I, I get up, I get dressed, get the kids ready, take them to school and I head to my studio um, just like I would any other job. So my hours are pretty much like nine till four or five or sometimes six. Yeah. Um, and I try really hard not to do weekend hours because, um, because I want to be with my kids. Mm -hmm. So every once in a while I'll have a customer who absolutely has to come in on the weekend. They can't come in during the week. And so I'll make a little, a quick appointment with them, like a 45 minute appointment with them. But most of the time, yeah, I just work Monday through Friday. I love how you said you treat your business like a business. And I think it shows with how you've been able to grow it. Cause a lot of people like, Oh, the kids are out of school at summer. I'm not going to work, you know, things right. like that. So you've really turned yours into a real business and it's showing um, with the revenue that you're getting out of it. Right. Thank you. Thanks. So have you been, you bet, have you been able to build your business without any outside funding? Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. Just bootstrapping it and then putting the money back into it to buy more raw materials and grow it. Yeah, and I think I priced my stuff well from the beginning. I mean, maybe not at the very, very beginning, but I learned very quickly um, that it was better to work smarter, not harder. 
And so I really made my pricing reflect that, reflect the work that I'm doing, um, the kind of materials that I use, the care that goes into every piece that I make. Um, and so I really, you know, I value, I value that. And so I think my pricing has been able, has been enough where I don't ever feel like I'm, you know, not getting paid enough for, for what we do. And I'm not paying, you know, I pay my, my employees, you know, very well. Um, you know, I, I think that's just how you should treat your, your people, the people who work with you, who help you grow your business. Like this is my business, but I couldn't do it without all of the people who are around me helping me. That's great. Yeah, that's great. So have you had mentors along the way to help you or how do you, how have you been able to grow the business side and stay on top of all the things that, that you need to, to build it and turn it into a real business? So that's a, that's a funny question for me because I'm such an introvert. It's very hard for me to get out of my shell and, and ask for help or, um, you know, go, go to social events where you're supposed to network and hand out your, I can't even tell you how many quote unquote network events I've been to where I for, totally forgot my business card. <laughs> I could probably tell you how many I've, I've gone to with business cards and that would be two. Wow. Um, but I'm just like very, that's just not my, my thing. That's not my strong suit. But I think in looking back, my mentors really have been in a way like my, my family. I know that sounds crazy, but my husband is like a super genius at marketing um, and finances. And he was the one who really would say, well, you know, you got to look at your numbers. You, you know, you, you said you made this much, but how much did you really make? So he was, he's always, and he still says things like that. So he's always making me look at, making me think about looking at my business like a business from the beginning. So he's been great in that respect, like a real mentor to me. And in, in, when I first had my Instagram account, it was so, <laughs> was so lame. And he was like, okay, we need to sit down and talk about your Instagram account. So he was, he's great. He's like a good mentor to me. Um, my brother, my sister, um, you know, they, they get my newsletters, they'll give me feedback, they buy my jewelry, um, you know, and they're, they're in their own respects, very smart business people as well. So I really respect what they say. Um, and my best friend, she's uh, the executive director at the Ronald McDonald House in Philadelphia. So she is a very smart businesswoman, and she's always there to help you know, even if, even when I was selling at my craft fair, she was the one who would come and stand next to me and help, you know, really get her hands dirty and, and put up the booth and put up the tent and take the booth down, take the tent down, drive us where we needed to go. Um, so I feel like the people who, who you would traditionally think of as a mentor, like somebody you meet in, in your business life, for me, it's actually been the people who've been closest to me kind of helping advise me from the beginning. And then, you know, even some of my, my customers have become, in a way, mentors. If I have an idea, they're the first people that I'll run to, this small group of, of customers that are just good friends now. Um, and I'll say, what do you guys think of this? I wanna, I wanna do this, what do you think? So it's almost like I have this little mini board of directors made up of, you know, customers, marketing people, um, business people, financial people. Um, and it, I, I never would have looked at it that way um, until actually recently I was looking back and saying, you know what, there, there have been a lot of people who have helped me through this journey. Um, and it's not necessarily your traditional, you know, maybe the traditional way that you would think of a mentor, but, but yeah. it's worked well for me. That's great that you're surrounded with that many people who can help you and that are supportive. Because a lot of people just don't have the support at home um, on their entrepreneurship journey. But the fact that you have the support and you have people who can help is even better. That's incredible. Well, I do have to say, I do have to say that at first when I decided to have a jewelry business, people were like, you're crazy. I mean, even my family, you're crazy. Every, there's, everybody makes jewelry. There's so many jewelry companies out there. But you know what? I was very focused and confident and just, you know, I just knew that I would do it. 
My sister just gave me a bracelet that said she believed she could, so she did. Oh, that's yeah. sweet. Yeah, so it's a very, you know, it, it, it hasn't always been easy. I haven't always had support, but I think the support, first and foremost, has to come from within you. Right. Your, your belief that you can do it. And then people just buy into it over time. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, one of the other things that you have done that I have noticed is you're absolutely so consistent on your social media. Do you want to talk about that for a minute, how you do that and how you plan out and organize your social media? Yeah, that's, that's a great topic. Um, so I started out just kind of posting whenever I felt like it or whenever I finished a ring or whenever I was sitting at my bench and it was very inconsistent. And then um, I started working with somebody who has had some knowledge. I just kind of like took her out to coffee and was like, what do you think? What should I be doing? And she was like, it's as easy as researching your hashtags and putting them on a little notepad on your phone because that's where you're posting from your phone most of the time. So I have this little you know, note in my phone that has different hashtags for different things. So I don't have to constantly type them over again. So that was an easy tip. That made it easier to post every day. And then just having quality photographs. So, you know, I'm shipping things out every day. So I've got jewelry in my hands, beautiful finished jewelry in my hands. It's not that hard for me to run over to my little photo area in my studio and take a couple of pictures. And then those are on my phone. Um, and then, so that's an easy tip. And the third thing is just setting a reminder and having something that will pop up on my phone and say, boom, it's 12 o'clock or 10 o'clock or whatever time, it's time to post. So those are the three things that make my life a little bit easier um, and allow me to do things consistently. Oh, that's great. That's a great tip. Do you, so do you do different hashtags daily so you're not always using the same hashtags? You have different little notes with different hashtags depending on what you're talking about yeah so you know there's obviously different types of customers that I appeal to um, and I usually when I'm posting for social media I just focus on one of them so that way the message is consistent um, and, it, and it, it appeals to all the customers in general um, even yeah. if I'm just targeting one specific type of customer um, but I have like different themes like if I'm posting an earring, I'll post different hashtags than if I'm posting an engagement ring. Yeah. Does that make sense? Because uh, it does. And I love it that you're doing it all on your phone. You're taking pictures as you finish an order before you ship it. So it's on your phone. So you've got photos in the queue. That's great. And yeah. Do you post to Instagram and then push it through to Facebook or do you post separate on each one? I post separately because of the Facebook algorithm. Um, Facebook does not like third party apps posting for you. So even though it's their own program, even though they own Instagram. Yep. Yeah. Very true. You've got to um, go native to the platform. Exactly. So, and it's not that hard. I actually will. Um, I love Facebook because you can just plan your posts out um, and just schedule them. So I will usually every two weeks or so, I'll sit down and I will go through my phone and I'll start creating these posts and scheduling them out. And then from there, that's when I'll be like, oh, what did I post on Facebook today? Okay, I'll move that over to, to Instagram. Smart. And so then you're not putting it through later or planally or a program like that, automating it. You can still use the same content, but you just do it different days. Well, I usually post on the same day. Um, the same content. It's just that I've scheduled Facebook out first. And you do it native to the platform. So it's on schedule on its own on Facebook. Correct. And then you go over and post the same thing on Instagram. Yes. But directly on Instagram and not through a, through a scheduling app. Correct. That's good. That's good. And I love that you are consistent on your stories too, especially since I love New York and you do your <laughs> shoulder work. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. That's so something that I have to work on also because Again, the person that I took out for coffee was just gave me such a good tip. And she said, you know, your stories need to be a little more like you're actually telling a story. So you don't want to be like, here's a picture of my kids. Here's a picture of my cats. Here's a picture of me sitting at my workbench. Here's a picture of New York City. Just pick one thing 
and take three, you know, post three different stories about that same thing. A beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah. 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 Now, being an introvert, have you had a hard time adapting to stories? Because I know a lot of people are afraid of that. So stories, if you notice, I'm not usually in my stories. <laughs> <laughs> you have the camera facing away. Right. I, I, but I'm working, I'm working more at putting myself out there because people do want to see what I'm doing. And, and I am the heart of my business. And if I don't put myself out in front, then nobody's going to know how amazing my jewelry is. That's very true. And you know what? The more uncomfortable you are, the more you grow. Because we become so comfortable and complacent that, you know, we don't stretch ourselves. And so when you stretch, that's when you grow. So that's, that's good. So that's true. good that you are that and working on that. Yeah. That's cool. So where do you see your company in five years? So my five-year plan, um, and I'm already about a year into it, is to have – Another revenue stream, like I said, I wanted to do um, the holiday markets, some pop-up shops, so that I start to incorporate some retail into my business, not just online retail, but actual hands-on retail. Awesome. Um, so I see, you know, having like a, someone in charge of that, someone in charge of the retail portion, like a retail manager, um, an operation manager, um, so they can manage all the different platforms and delivering the jewelry on time to people. Um, so, and, and I see continuing to work with people here in New York. Like I get, I get some people will push back on the price. Like why is your, why is this silver ring, you know, $180 when I can get it, you know, over here for on Amazon for 50 and I'll say, well, you know, you're paying either a factory <laughs> and low quality gems and low quality jewelry that'll break within a year exactly. versus, you know, you're investing with my jewelry. You're actually investing into an heirloom that you'll be able to hand down for future generations. So I don't even know where I was going with that. Um, um, your five year plan. So where you're taking it. Yeah. So I feel like I, I'm never going to change where I make my jewelry because that's such a core value to me is to, you know, create jobs and keep them here in New York. Um, so I just continue to see that growing. I see continuing, continuing to grow my staff, um, continuing to push myself. In fact, this year I um, made a declaration that I am going to raise $30,000 for city harvest oh. by December, 2019. So th that is a huge crazy number to me. Um, and I normally donate money through my business to City Harvest each year, uh, but nothing close to this $30,000 goal. But again, like you can't get too comfortable where you are. You have to constantly be challenging yourself in different ways. And so I thought to myself, what would it be like? Like I'm already feeding 250 families and that's wonderful. But what would it be like if I could feed 2,500 families? Wow. That'd be so, awesome. What a great goal. So you're a company with heart that gives back even better. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's that. another core value for, for us. I love that. That's great.